Hello, everyone, um, and good afternoon. Um, um, I'm very happy today to um, uh, have Kartik Srinivasan um, as, um, um, for, a, for a nice talk today. Uh, so Kartik is a, um, a fellow at the NISC Physical Measurement Laboratory and University of Maryland. Um, he um, works on many things, including um, nonlinear nanophotonics towards uh, creating and generating and uh, converting frequency, um, frequency uh, converting light at many different frequencies. And I think today he's going to talk about um, um, quantum and classical light sources and transduce transducers at any light, uh, any uh, wavelength using nonlinear nanophotonics. Um, um, so, uh, just a quick reminder uh, before we start that uh, if you have any questions, please you raise your hand or uh, type in the chat box and. Um, uh, Kart is going to take the questions uh, during the talk at um, any appropriate moment. Um, please take it away. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, Vahid, for you know the introduction and and organizing everything. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to to talk about work we've been doing at NIST and, and the University of Maryland. Uh, you know, basically trying to develop these nonlinear nanophotonics technology to address you know some of the different challenges in quantum information science and. And one that we think is present is the kind of the wide variety of different wavelengths that, that you'd like to have access to. Um, and so this is certainly like an aspirational goal, uh, I want to state from the beginning. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to start by trying to motivate, you know, what questions it is we're trying to address and why we think they're interesting. And I'm going to begin by, you know, just reviewing some of the different ways in which, you know, nonlinear optics is already used extensively in quantum science. I want to talk about why nanophotonic platforms in, in particular are sort of compelling platforms for developing nonlinear optical devices. And then with that kind of background, I'm going to go into some of the ingredients that are involved in trying to get efficient nonlinear processes to work um, in our particular kind of geometries, which are nanophotonic resonators. And then I'll go and talk about some kind of specific device demonstrations that we've done, uh, these visible telecom and tangled photon pair sources, uh, microresonator optical parametric oscillators, quantum frequency converters, and you know, kind of the overall flavor is that we're hoping to, you know, develop platforms basically where we can really flexibly tailor the nonlinear interactions in, in these systems in order to address some of the different systems people develop in, in quantum science. And I had listed here and mentioned to Vahid that I was interested also in speaking about um, these microresonator frequency combs, which are being used for, for optical atomic clocks. I don't think I'm going to have a whole lot of time to talk about combs in this talk, but I'll, I'll come to it in a couple of different points. Uh, so, you know, just as a, as a sort of um, starting point, when we think about nonlinear optics, we often talk about, you know, a medium's electronic polarization that describes how it responds to an applied electromagnetic field. And for nonlinear optics, we care about, you know, sort of the nonlinear terms in this polarization. And for the purposes of this talk, what's, you know, kind of really important is that these nonlinearity basically ensures that or allows the possibility that you can have output optical frequencies that differ from the input optical frequencies. Uh, of course, this is, you know, very well known in, in optics labs. It's used, you know, throughout kind of all of our different labs. Uh, and this is a chart that I took from the Topic of Photonics website that I think is kind of interesting. Here, what they're talking about is the development of their continuous wave laser platforms, you know, from uh, over a broad spectral range. And, and why I like it is that it really kind of shows how much uh, nonlinear optics is already being used to access different wavelengths. Certainly the extremities in the ultraviolet and the mid-infrared but also kind of important wavelength regions and, and gaps that are at visible wavelengths, for example. And you know, this is using these kind of classic processes like second harmonic generation and some indifference frequency generation and, and so on. You know, one way that this type of nonlinear optics is used in metrology is in, in optical atomic clocks. Uh, and so what you have here is you have a laser that you basically um, stabilize to an environmentally insensitive narrow line with optical transition. And many of, the sense that many of the systems that provide such transitions are operating at, at visible or ultraviolet wavelengths. And so as a result, you might at least need the, the nonlinear optics in order to reach those, those specific wavelengths. Um, but once you've locked your laser to this atomic transition, you know, it's oscillating at hundreds of terahertz of, of frequency. And so that's not something you're going to count directly. Uh, and so you use a stabilized optical frequency comb as kind of an effective divider that phase coherently divides down to the microwave domain where you can use electronics to now count. Uh, and this optical frequency comb underneath the hood has a lot of nonlinear optics typically. You know, of course, nonlinear optics has been used for generating quantum states, you know, throughout the, the history of quantum optics, you know, particularly spontaneous parametric down conversion has been a workhorse. Um, squeeze light is impacting things like LIGO to enable, you know, precision measurement beyond the standard quantum limit. 
Uh, you have groups that are working on the synthesis of large scale photonic quantum states for things like quantum computation and, and quantum networks. You know, and then speaking of quantum networks, right, we can think about the role that nonlinear optics can play to help connect different nodes in a, in a quantum network. This is, you know, kind of an older cartoon diagram from, from a review article from Jeff Kimball, um, where he considers this kind of elementary quantum network consisting of matter-based nodes for storage and computation and photons for communication between the different matter-based nodes. And we can think about nonlinear optics as basically helping us transduce the photons from one wavelength to the other to be able to connect different nodes. You know, in particular, they answer you know, certain challenges, right? So, so for example, what happens if these matter-based nodes are most naturally connected to photons that are not good for building your network, right? So maybe these are photons at very short wavelengths where you can't use fiber optics with low losses. And then you also might have the scenario in which you want to connect together dissimilar nodes. You might want, might want to have one quantum system for storage, another quantum system for computation. And so these kind of quantum transducers based upon nonlinear optics can help you address the, the fact that these different systems might operate at different colors. And that's not the full challenge. The full challenge is influencing not just the photon center frequency, but the overall temporal profile. Um, but certainly influencing the color is, is you know, a starting challenge, basically. Now, I think nanophotonics in particular is an interesting platform for developing nonlinear optics because we can really think about going from sort of isolated nonlinear optical structures to kind of full nonlinear optical systems. Uh, and so this is some nice work that's coming out of Dirk Englund's group at MIT where they developed these photon pair sources in, in silicon on insulator. And this, this pair source consists not just of the ring resonator in which we have spontaneous Fourier wave mixing. It also consists of a number of different elements for, um, you know, such as multimode interferometers, phase shifters, directional couplers, um, filters, and so on. And this starts to become, you know, a relatively large component count that is now kind of flexibly and easily operable on the chip. And, and as you kind of scale things up further, it becomes harder and harder to replicate these sorts of things with, with bulk optics. You know, at, at the same time, sort of in the maybe the classical integrated photonics community, there's been a lot of work in developing um, the integration of, of laser sources together with nonlinear nanophotonics. Uh, so this is work that's recently come out of John Bauer's group at UC Santa Barbara, where they've been developing these heterogeneously integrated lasers on silicon nitride, which is a good platform for nonlinear optics, as I'll describe. And then this is some work coming out of Tobias Kippenberg's group uh, at EPFL, where they kind of have a hybrid integration of, of laser gain chips with with nonlinear nanophotonics chips. You know, at the same time, there have been groups that have been looking at the integration of, of single quantum emitters with, with photonic platforms that, that are compatible with nonlinear optics. Uh, and so this is some work that's coming out of our group where we looked at the integration of, of single indium arsenide quantum dots and gallium arsenide uh, together with silicon nitride nanophotonics where the silicon nitride gives us access to low loss and, and sort of this chi-3 nonlinearity. And I think if we go from sort of the technology and the integration to kind of the fundamental nonlinear optics, one of the things that I really like about the nanophotonic platforms that I think is compelling is that to a large extent, you can be in a regime in which your geometry really dictates um, to a large extent your nonlinear interactions. Uh, so to give an example, I'm going to return to this later in the talk, but this is an example of a microresonator optical parametric oscillator where we're just going to um, essentially keep the pump frequency close to fixed. And what we're varying instead from one device to the other is just the geometry of this ring. And we can broadly tune the output frequency of this device. So we can generate light in the green, the yellow, or the orange, you know, primarily through this geometric control. And fundamentally, this comes about because, and, and this is true for all of these kind of high index contrast nanophotonic platforms, is that your geometric confinement means that the phase and group velocity with which light propagates through the waveguides is really strongly determined by um, you know, geometry, and it's sensitive at kind of the tens of nanometer length scales, and it's also a strong function of wavelength. Uh, and so we, you know, tried to think about how we can put together these kind of nice things that are coming about in the community and some of the work that we're interested in doing. And one of the things that we're quite interested in is being, being able to use nanophotonics to address different quantum systems that, that are of interest. Uh, and so, you know, of course, there are these trapped atoms and ions and, and color centers and crystals and, and quantum dots that typically operate maybe in the visible to short near infrared wavelength. Uh, and when we try and you know, work with these systems in the lab, we tend to use you know, external cavity diode lasers. Or in some cases, we use these titanium sapphire lasers when we want to have access to a really broad range of wavelengths. And you know, they're very remarkable instruments for the lab that have a lot of flexibility built into them. But these are not the most kind of compact systems if we're going to really think about deploying some of these quantum technologies, you know, sort of outside of the lab and having, you know, multiple units and, and things like that. 
Um, you know, on the other hand, there's really been some tremendous work in the development of chip integrated lasers that can have, you know, amazing characteristics, you know, 100 hertz line widths or lower, things like that. This often happens in the telecom. There's also, you know, nice work in develop kind of, developing kind of compact DFB lasers and things like that, sort of a little bit more in the near infrared. And so what we think is kind of maybe a compelling vision is trying to combine these kind of chip integrated um, high performance laser sources with kind of flexible nonlinear and nanophotonics to try and be able to address these different, you know, atomic systems or, or sort of quantum emitter systems that are relevant, uh, you know, for QIS applications. And you know, I'll say that we have kind of you know, maybe a similar vision or similar hopes in the context of things like quantum networks. So this is again a, sort of a schematic depiction of a quantum network. This is coming out of Hansen's group at Delft, where now the matter-based nodes are, are color center uh, spins. And you know these are typically connected to photons that are in the visible or maybe the short near infrared. And so to connect over long distances using fibers, we might want the nonlinear and nanophotonics, uh, things like quantum frequency converters or entangled photon terasources that can enable links, you know, at telecom bands to promote things like remote entanglement. And of course, you know, in the end, we don't want just these nonlinear resonators. We want these full nonlinear integrated systems I mentioned, where ideally you have the pump lasers involved, you have the, the filters and all the linear elements that you need. And then going another step beyond that is maybe we don't want to just be able to develop this technology for a certain color center spin. We really want to be able to develop this for a broad range of technologies, you know, quantum dots, diamond color center, silicon carbide, other sorts of systems. And it would be great if, if this kind of development can be done such that at the end of the day, what you do is basically specify designs in order to be able to access these different systems. And, and maybe in the end, you even send this off to some, some foundry to get fabricated. So that's kind of like the overall motivation, I would say, for why we're interested in, in this kind of nonlinear nanophotonics and how we think it can play a role in, in quantum information science. Um, Vahid, I don't know if, if there's any questions at this point, I, I can try and address them or I, I, can, I can move on to kind of the next section. Um, I, we don't have any questions. Maybe you can just carry on. Okay, okay great. So, you know, that, that again is sort of the motivation behind what we're trying to do. And now we need to think about, okay, what are the, the sort of essential ingredients that are involved in, in getting these things to work in, in practice, right? So we need to start with an appropriate material. We need a material that has relatively large nonlinear optical coefficients. And we also want broadband optical transparency so we can accommodate all these different systems that are at visible and short near infrared wavelengths. Now, typically for nonlinear optics, you, you say you need to have access to large optical intensities in order to you know, enable the nonlinear response of the medium. And you know, typically this might involve kind of laser, high laser powers with the nanophotonics, you know, we can achieve this through resonant enhancement is, is gonna be one approach at least. Uh, and then we need to kind of satisfy these kind of core ingredients that you have for these parametric nonlinear processes, you know, things like energy conservation and, and momentum conservation or phase matching. You know, and these two things of course are, are kind of paramount when you think about parametric nonlinear processes. Energy conservation, you typically, um, you know, maybe take for granted in, in bulk, media and, and waveguides, as long as you have, you know, transparency at those wavelengths, they admit sort of a continuous frequency spectrum. Uh, but momentum conservation or, or the phase matching, that tends to be non-trivial, right? And that's because materials are dispersive. So light is propagating at different speeds as a function of wavelength. And of course, that's why, you know, we have prism effects in, in silica, for example. Uh, and so there's all a huge, you know, range of different nonlinear nanophotonics platforms that the community are, are working on. And, you know, I can't even do it justice on this one slide, but I'll say there's a lot of different nice, you know, results. There's this uh, lithium niobate platform, you know, Marty Fair and, and, and Rob, Bob Beyer and other folks at Stanford have worked on this for, you know, kind of decades. And there are these new incarnations of thin film lithium niobate that Amir is working on or Marco Lankar, Chang Lin, other people. Um, there are these materials like silicon carbide that are becoming available in thin film form. So like Yelena uh, Vukovic's group is working on this and materials like aluminum nitride, like Hong Kang's group is working on it and, and many others, you know, I, I basically don't have time to mention. Um, I will say that, you know, what we work on is, is silicon nitride uh, grown on silicon dioxide on a silicon substrate. You know, we're not the only ones. This is a very popular medium for nonlinear nanophotonics. There's some nice review articles, uh, you know, some of the, the key players that work on, on this type of platform. And it's primarily a chi-3 medium. So we're gonna be talking about Fourier mixing uh, processes. And, and we like it because it has this broad transparency window from you know, kind of the visible out into the, maybe the mid IR. It has a pretty large nonlinear refractive index. You can get high cavity quality factors across a broad range of wavelengths. And I'd say two of the things that we care about it, you know, the most are, are a little bit prosaic, but 
you know, one thing is that it's really a widely available platform, both in research fabrication facilities like the one at NIST and, and also in commercial foundries. And the fabrication processes are relatively well understood. And you think, you know, these things together are important because if we're able to develop things at NIST, hopefully that means that it's kind of transferable to, to people, you know, elsewhere within the community. Uh, and so as kind of I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the key sort of parameter that we're going to be using to, to engineer phase matching is going to be the strong geometric confinement that you have in these high refractive index contrast waveguides. This is represented here in terms of this effective index that's related to the propagation constant of light that's, that's going through this waveguide. And again, you have these, this effective index that has this strong variation with frequency and also with geometry. And this comes down to the fact that you know, the fraction of your optical field that's residing in your core relative to your cladding has this strong variation with geometry and, and with frequency. And so if we think about, you know, a specific nonlinear process now, we can think about something like spontaneous forward mixing. And so this is a process where two pump photons get annihilated and you generate a signal photon and an idler photon. And the frequency of these two generated photons adds up to twice the pump frequency. So this is equation here. And so what we have to look at for something like a silicon nitride waveguide is if we want to pump at 250 terahertz and generate idler and signal photons at 200 and 300 terahertz, we need to have a waveguide that basically crosses these specific points where we have the you know, simultaneous frequency matching and, and the phase matching, essentially, which can be written in terms of the effective index of, of the waveguide mode. Now, unfortunately, you know, we typically don't use waveguides in silicon nitride because ultimately it's just not a nonlinear enough platform in order for us to get high efficiencies for, for low pump powers. So what we do instead is we put these things in, in optical resonators and we then combine the field confinement with, with large optical quality factors. And this means that you can access these very large circulating intensities for kind of milliwatt level input powers. And this is really consistent with the types of chip integrated compact lasers that I've been describing so far. Now, I should also mention that it's not just about the resonant enhancement. You know, there's some applications, you know, for example, where we're generating photons where we might want those photon line widths. This is, you know, really maybe in the quantum domain, we might want these spontaneously generated photons to have the same line widths as the photons that are generated from some of the solid state quantum emitters, like, like quantum dots or color center spins. And so we want to have photons that have line widths of maybe 10 megahertz to gigahertz, depending upon that system. And so that's really compatible with using these high Q cavities. And of course, there's a lot of different cavity geometries that people have developed. These are just some of the ones that we've looked at over the years. Uh, but our real you know, criteria on what kind of cavity we want to work with is that first, we need it to have a high cavity quality factor across you know, a wide range of wavelengths that can be widely separated. And then again, we want to have you know, this good fabrication control and, and hopefully relative lim relatively limited sensitivity to fabrication. Um, because ultimately, you know, phase and frequency matching are what are paramount for us to get the nonlinear process to work in the first place, um, you know, above, um, you know, trying to get the highest Q cavity or the smallest mode volume cavity. So we work with these really simple microring resonators that pretty much everybody in integrated photonics works with at, at some level. Um, and we do so because it's, it's quite straightforward to realize high cavity quality factors and small mode volumes across a very wide range of frequencies. Uh, of course, when you work with this resonator or, or you know, any resonator, you're going to have this, this fact that you no longer admit a continuous band of frequencies. You now support these, these discrete resonances, right? So when I earlier said that, oh, you know, energy conservation is straightforward, uh, you know, that was true in bulk or in, in waveguides. But in these resonators, you know, now what we have to worry about is if we have a set of modes that are phase matched, we also need them to be frequency matched. So they need to have the right frequency relationship with respect to each other to simultaneously satisfy these two criteria. And you know, how well do they have to be frequency matched? Well, you know, we think about the cavity line width is gonna be on the order of 100 megahertz. And so somehow we need to have frequency matching that's on that order, even if the modes are separated by you know, hundreds of terahertz. And so it's not you know, necessarily a trivial challenge. And one of the nice things about these whispering gallery mode resonators is that you know, their, their functional behavior is, is relatively straightforward. So because of the symmetry in this azimuthal direction, you can write the field dependence in this azimuthal direction, uh, you know, in, in terms of this azimuth angle phi, you know, very simply. It just goes as e to the im phi, where again, phi is the azimuth angle, and m is just some integer mode number index, basically. And, you know, I'm harping on this azimuthal direction because for these traveling waves and these microring resonators, that's the direction in which you need to have your phase matching or your momentum conservation. And so we think about something like our spontaneous forward mixing and we say like, okay, we wanna have 
phase matching, so we want twice the propagation constant of the pump to equal the sum of the propagation constants of the signal and the idler fields. And this now just becomes you know, kind of a mode number matching criterion for our azimuthal modes of, of this ring resonator. So basically, you know, if we choose the correct modes, then they're going to be phase matched. And then we have to ensure that those, those, that set of modes is also frequency matched. And so again, if we go back to this kind of diagram of our frequency and phase matching, instead of having kind of this continuous dispersion curve that we would have in, in the case of a waveguide, now we have our resonances. And so we need our cavity resonances to really line up such that we si simultaneously satisfy this frequency matching requirement at the same time we have our phase matching, which we're now calling this mode number matching. Yeah, and so this is not going to just happen for any arbitrary ring resonator, basically. But if we control this, this kind of geometric confinement, so the cross section of the ring and the size of the ring, uh, which influences bending, basically, um, then in many cases, we can engineer this phase and frequency matching. And this has been kind of the dominant control knob that we've been employing for the different devices we've been looking at. And so we have these two criteria that I've, I've mentioned many times now, this, this mode number matching and this frequency matching. And you know, sort of implicitly what I've been saying so far is that the resonance frequencies we care about are for a cavity independent of how much light we put into it. Uh, but of course we know that for these chi-3 media, these resonances shift when you put more light into it because you have a Kerr effect. So you have this intensity dependent uh, refractive index. And then you also have thermorefractive effects. Uh, and so ultimately, we do have to take into account these in intensity dependent frequency shifts depending upon which regime uh, in which we're trying to operate our devices. Uh, and so this is again just sort of saying that when necessary, we take into account these nonlinear and sort of thermal frequency shifts. Okay, so I want to take a couple of minutes just because there may be some people in the audience who are kind of interested in the topic of these frequency combs to kind of contrast the picture that I've been describing so far with what you might, you know, read about in, in kind of this Kirkcomb literature. Uh, and, you know, I really like these Kirkcombs. We work on them quite a bit. And it's a potentially a very powerful technology for, you know, kind of uh, integral component for things like clocks or for frequency synthesizers, um, uh, you know, spectroscopy and, and laser ranging and other sorts of things like that. And when I think about the Kirkcomb, I say, you know, sort of at a very basic level, you have your input laser at a single frequency and it gets spectrally redistributed into hundreds of signal and idler modes. And that's what you see in this, this Kirkcomb spectrum here. Whereas in the case I've been describing thus far, we're really just talking about, you know, three modes, a pump, a signal and an idler. Uh, so in the Kirkcomb community, you know, what you have to worry about is kind of the global dispersion profile around the pump. So where all these different resonances are around your pump. And what you typically do is you, you look at where these resonances are and maybe you do a, a Taylor expansion into these different dispersion parameters that are you know, very analogous to the dispersion parameters you have in nonlinear fiber optics. And you say things like you wanna have anomalous dispersion so that your curve frequency shifts are gonna compensate for your intrinsic resonator dispersion. Now, you know, kind of in contrast in our case, at least what I've described so far, we really are just caring about the absolute frequencies of, of very specific modes. Um, but ultimately, what I'm going to tell you later on is that actually the, the full global dispersion, or at least the dispersion across, uh, you know, more than those three modes might matter, um, just because we need to be able to sort of suppress and, and mitigate sort of competing processes. But ultimately, we still end up, you know, not necessarily talking about things in terms of dispersion parameters, but instead just talking about these absolute mode frequencies, which you can basically think of as just including all orders of dispersion. So again, we have kind of these, these sort of main requirements um, you know, for these kind of nonlinear processes. If I take a specific one of spontaneous forward mixing, you know, kind of the first sort of application I want to describe is one in which we have pump photons in the near infrared. We generate signal photons in the visible and idler photons in the telecom. And you know, what you might ask is, OK, so if I want to get frequency matching to work out, I can just measure the positions of the cavity resonances. right? I, I showed you that transmission spectrum. And we could use a comb if we want to be ultra accurate, or we could use just a wave meter and we could get down to you know, 10 megahertz accuracy relatively easily. And if our cavity line widths are on the order of 100 megahertz, it's, it's straightforward to determine whether modes are frequency matched. But, but how do we actually know that those are the right modes that are phase matched, right? So how do we determine which azimuthal modes you know, we're working with? And, and this isn't something that's always an issue. So if we think about photon pair generation based upon spontaneous forward mixing that happens close to the pump, you typically don't worry about the absolute mode numbers. You know, you, you say something like, well, I'm going to pump on this specific mode. And if I count three FSRs up, 
then the mode that's three FSRs down is going to naturally be uh, you know, mode number matched or, or phase matched. Uh, but in our case, we're going to have these very wide frequency separations. And so we need to be able to count mode numbers that differ by you know, maybe 140 in this case. And it, it's not trivial to just do that by having a laser that you know, goes across all of these different frequencies. And so the way that we address this was actually um, developed by my uh, postdoc Xi Wen Lu. He actually did it before he came to my lab. He did it when he was at the University of Rochester in, in Chang's group. And what he basically takes advantage of is the coherent backscattering that you can have in these ring resonators. And, and so this is something that all of us often see in the lab where some random surface roughness causes a coherent coupling between the clockwise and counterclockwise modes in the resonator. But what Xi Wen does is he really does a targeted um, you know, coherent backscattering. So we write a grading on the inner wall of our ring resonators. And the periodicity of that grading is set such that it specifically couples you know, a, a specific order azimuthal mode in the clockwise and counterclockwise directions. Uh, and so that's kind of shown here. This is some data where we show that, okay, if we set this, up, set this up appropriately, there's one mode in this spectrum that's frequency split. And this was targeted for the M equals 302 mode. In this case, in the 1550 nanometer band, we do the same thing. It's targeted for the M equals 162 uh, mode. Um, I don't remember if I said nanometer, nanometer here, but these are just mode numbers, actually. And so we don't tend to actually use these mode splitting devices in the nonlinear optics itself, at least not for the moment. I'll kind of come back to that later. But really what we use them for is kind of a ruler on the chip. So this really just kind of tells us where we are in, in mode number space and really allows us to positively identify you know, what modes we're working with. Um, so I think that's kind of you know, a little section on some of the kind of technical ingredients that's involved in the work. And, I'm going to move on to talk about some of the you know, specific uh, demonstrations that we've been working on. Um, so maybe, again, I'll say that if there's any questions, you know, Vahid, um, just let me know. Yeah, I don't see any questions um, so far. OK, great. No problem. So yeah, again, I want to now kind of go through how we take these sort of ingredients and this overall spirit of what we want to try and get out of the nonlinear nanophotonics to think about you know, these very specific applications. And I'm going to start with the one that I've been talking about so far that, that was done by, by Xi Wen, which is this uh, photon pair generation where we have these widely separated photons, one in the visible and one in the telecom. And so by doing all the engineering that I described, you know, we can take this ring resonator and we can pump it at 930 nanometers and generate photons in the 660 nanometer band and the 1550 nanometer band. We can go and measure the frequencies of these modes and we see that their frequency matched to within you know, a couple hundred megahertz, despite the modes being separated by a couple hundred terahertz. And again, we use this kind of mode number indexing as a critical part of this work. Uh, and so these photons are, are generated, you know, uh, coincident in time. And so if you do coincidence counting experiments, you really see that you have this kind of high SNR. This is kind of a coincidence to accidentals ratio um, that can be quite, quite high. And we can kind of look at how this behaves as a function of sort of the, the pair flux that you're generating from this kind of device. And sort of the upshot is that it actually is a pretty good device. I mean, you sort of get um, these sort of effective SNR values um, at certain pair fluxes that are quite comparable to sort of more conventional tabletop systems like um, cavity enhanced um, spontaneous parametric down conversion, for example. Uh, and so the reason why we really are interested in these kind of photon pair sources is because the photons are not just correlated. You can actually show that they're entangled in a time energy basis. And in this case, because one photon is in the telecom band, you know, that entanglement is, of course, going to persist, even if that photon propagates over you know, 20 kilometers of optical fiber, which, which we sort of explicitly showed. And what we want to think about doing you know, kind of down the road is using these kinds of sources to help you know, promote remote entanglement. So you can imagine that maybe you have color center spins that are currently entangled with visible wavelength photons. And if you put in these kind of intermediate photon pair sources, then through entanglement swapping, you could eventually realize a situation in which these color center spins are are remotely entangled over, over very long distances, so, you know, at least within the limit of the propagation losses of fibers uh, in the telecom. Yeah, you know, I think from the kind of technology platform perspective, what we also find to be exciting about these sources is that by you know doing this, exercising this geometric control that I've been harping on, in this case by just varying the ring width of the micro rings and also slightly varying the pump wavelength, we can broadly tune the frequency of the signal photon. So the signal photon can be anywhere from about 630 nanometers all the way up to 820 nanometers. Of course, since we've constrained the pump photons to be in this narrow region, what this means is that the idler wavelengths are also going to widely vary you know, from about 1050 nanometers to 1.8 microns. 
Um, but if we really want to pin it down, so really have the idler at 1550 and the signal at some specific wavelength, we can just re-engineer the system so we can pump at the appropriate central uh, position. And you know, that's something that we've done in, in select cases. So for example, this is a resonator where we've re-engineered to pump at 1020 nanometers. And now you have a signal at 780 nanometers and the corresponding idler close to 1500 nanometers. So we really think that there's this ability to, to exercise geometric control to address, you know, not just a specific quantum system, but to potentially to address a variety of different quantum systems and, and be able to connect them to, to telecom bands. Okay, so I want to you know, move to kind of the next application, which is this idea that it's not just quantum light that we should care about in, in these quantum applications. We also care about the classical control light that we, you know, we use to, to probe you know, some of these different atomic systems and wanting to be able to do so um, by combining kind of this chip integrated laser technology with, with nonlinear nanophotonics. And so the basic idea is that you have something very similar to our photon pair source I've already described. But instead of operating in the spontaneous regime of photon pair generation, we want to operate in a stimulated regime. So we basically go above threshold and we drive this into parametric oscillation. And ideally, what we want to be able to find is that the sidebands that we generate, which is going to be you know, coherent laser light, is broadly tunable if we can control the geometry appropriately. Uh, I want to have an aside for a moment to say that you know, there are actually some reasons to use Chi-3 beyond the fact that it's a silicon-based material and, and broadly accessible and so on. And one of the reasons is, you know, comes down to the fact that in a Chi-2 platform, you have one pump photon that combines to give you your signal and idler photons. Uh, and so what that means is that if you want to have you know, telecom invisible uh, photons, your pump needs to be in the UV if you're going to do kind of a single stage Chi-2 process. Whereas in the Chi-3, you have two pump photons that make up this, this sum of these frequencies. And so that means that our pump is sitting in between these two photons, uh, the telecom and the visible. And so the overall frequency span that we have to worry about is a lot less. And that's kind of important because you know, not all of the integrated photonics platforms are, are good at the UV. They might not have transparency there. Um, but also, you know, materials tend to be quite dispersive as you go down to the shorter and shorter wavelengths. And so for example, you know, in our case, for one of the things I'm going to be describing in a moment, we worry about photons in this frequency range, uh, you know, so this is maybe 200, uh, you know, well, 200 terahertz, let's say to 500 terahertz. Whereas if we needed to worry about the UV photons for the Chi-2 process, we'd have a much larger amount of dispersion uh, to have to try and compensate for. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to drive our devices into parametric oscillation. And we tried to do so right away based upon those photon pair sources. But unfortunately, instead of generating this kind of clean spectrum with one signal and one idler that I described earlier, we instead create all these different parametric sidebands near our pump. Right? And this is perhaps not that surprising because so far I told you, well, we just care about three modes. And, and what that neglects is the fact that you might have competing processes that are also phase and frequency matched. And, and maybe they're going to be you know, more efficient. There's going to be some reason to preferentially select this process instead of the widely separated process that, that we might be interested in. You know, fortunately, we can combat this. And so what we have to do is not just worry about the phase and frequency matching of, of the modes we care about. We also have to worry about kind of mismatching this process that, that we don't like. Uh, and so this was done by, by Xu and last year in kind of a first demonstration where we showed that you can generate these very clean optical parametric oscillation devices where, where the signal and either wavelengths are, are kind of widely separated. Uh, and so we have sort of a generic prescription for this. I mean, it comes down to trying to get devices that have this kind of effective dispersion profile. This is really a frequency mismatch parameter. And what we try and do is near the pump, we want to suppress this competing Fourier mixing processes. And so we want to have essentially normal dispersion. That means that when the frequency shifts kick in due to the nonlinearity, the modes actually get more mismatched than they were when there is no light in them. And then, of course, we simultaneously want to have the modes that we care about be, be frequency and phase match. Uh, and so very recently in this work that was published um, just a few weeks ago, we really tried to demonstrate you know, this process taken to another step forward. Uh, and so what we tried to do here is we, we re-engineered our devices. So we were pumping them at 780 nanometers. And we saw that if we just slightly varied the pump frequency and varied the geometry, we can access a, a very broad range of wavelengths. And so what I'm showing here in the middle panel is basically the tuning of our pump laser. And so it's just tuning by a few terahertz. And this is across many different devices on the chip. And then we have our generated signal light and our generated idler light. 
And you can see kind of on the balance, the idler plus the signal covers a, a big range, you know, from 1200 nanometers to about 560 nanometers. And if you just focus in on kind of specific frequency points for the signal, you have this green light, yellow light, orange light, and red light. Um, and so we think this is kind of exciting that you're able to access all these different wavelengths, you know, on the same chip just through this geometric control. Of course, you know, we're not generating useful amounts of output power right now. So it's not like we can go and drive some, some quantum system right now with this. And there's a lot of different things we need to understand in order to be able to make this, you know, kind of better, maybe more finely tunable, things like that. Um, but we think it's a kind of an interesting advance. Yeah, so far, I've, I haven't said too much about like the efficiency of our nonlinear devices. We, we talked about the photon pair sources and said that they're pretty bright given their signal to noise level. Um, and then I said the optical parametric oscillators are not producing as much power as we like. Um, but it'd be nice to have some, some gauge of how efficient these devices are. Uh, and so to do this, she went to this experiment where we now explicitly seed um, the idler channel um, with, with telecom light, basically. So instead of having a you know, a process that uh, is spontaneous or that's seeded by vacuum fluctuations. We now have this coherent signal that we inject into the telecom channel and we see how efficiently we generate visible light. So this is just stimulated four wave mixing, but we really tried to optimize the devices to try and get them to be as efficient as we could. Uh, and so what we see are, are these kind of, you know, pretty clean spectra where we have our pump, our input seed, and now our spectrally translated light. And we kind of look at what our, our sort of power efficiency and, and translation is. And we get these kind of numbers. We get maybe 30% efficiency for you know, a few hundred microwatts of pump power, which means that we're kind of generating you know, decent amounts of, of visible light now, kind of at the 100 microwatt level, which we could use for some kind of on-ship spectroscopy purposes. Um, of course, we would like to, to push this even further and be able to operate it in higher power limits. Um, but it's, this is actually a pretty efficient device if you look in sort of an absolute sense compared to various types of nonlinear nanophotonics that, that's been looked at. You know, so you can ask the question, you know, so if you have this kind of spectral translation process, could I replace my seed, uh, you know, instead of having this continuous wave laser at 50 and 50 nanometers, what if I have like a single photon at 50 and 50 nanometers? Can I convert this to visible wavelengths? And, and unfortunately, this is not going to be a great way to work with, with quantum states of light, like single photon states. You know, and maybe the answer is obvious is that you know, at the same time, we have this stimulated process that we care about, we're going to have the spontaneous process that, that we described earlier, right? So we're going to have the pump photons that are getting converted to signal and idler. And really what this is a statement of is that for the quantum frequency conversion, what we really want is kind of a beam splitter like Hamiltonian. You know, we want input photons to get annihilated and output photons to get created. And then this, you know, kind of degenerate Fourier mixing process we've used so far, you know, that's not what happens. When we generate these visible photons, it's two pump photons and a telecom photon that create the visible. You know, you know fortunately, there are four wave mixing processes that can be used for quantum frequency conversion. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, the four wave mixing Bragg scattering process. And this was work that was done by former postdoc uh, Cheng Li, who's now at, at Carnegie Mellon. This was actually one of the first things we looked at for this microcavity nonlinear optics. And how the forward mixing Bragg shattering process works is you have two pumps. So it's a non-degenerate process. And you can kind of think of the difference in the pump frequencies as kind of creating an effective grading in your chi 3 nonlinearity that scatters your input signal to an output signal. And the spectral shift is just dictated by the difference in the two pump frequencies. Uh, and so if you go through kind of the formalism, you can show this is really a beam splitter like Hamiltonian for, for kind of quantum state transfer. And Cheng, you know, kind of designed these devices using some of the different engineering techniques I've, I've mentioned. And what we saw is they can be pretty efficient. So he had this result where you, you take input light in the 980 band that starts at this horizontal uh, black line level. You can down convert to the telecom band with an on-chip photon uh, flux conversion efficiency of about 60%. Um, and this is bi-directional. So it also works if you start in the telecom band and want to upconvert to the 980 band. And the efficiency is actually mostly limited by how well we couple light into and out of the resonator. So if we did a better job of that in principle, we should be able to access kind of 90% photon number efficiencies you know, on the chip. You know, the next important thing is really noise. So do we have you know, kind of a noise process like what I described before? And unfortunately, one of the things that we have to worry about is that we don't necessarily have the exact same type of spontaneous forward mixing I described earlier. But you can have this issue that your individual pump fields can generate spontaneously, uh, you know, spontaneous Fourier fixing. And if these spontaneously generated photons from this pump, you know, spectrally coincide with our target frequency, th that's going to be noise. 
Uh, and so what we found is you know, this is a low noise process from the perspective of, of classical frequency conversion. Um, we can kind of get low, uh, noise levels down to maybe the picowatt or sub picowatt levels, but probably not as low noise as what we really need for quantum frequency conversion of, of you know, particularly sort of single photon states. And I think this is also just a statement of the fact that when we did this, this device, we really engineered for the phase and frequency matching of the modes we care about. And we didn't worry about these competing processes. And, and certainly that's something you have to do if you wanna be able to get the noise down uh, in the system. But one thing we were able to do is look at a different Fourier mixing process in the same kind of devices, where now we have our two pump uh, fields, both in the 1550 band. So they're really far spectrally removed from our signal and our idler. You know, because the frequencies are now only separated by a few terahertz, we're only gonna be shifting our photons by a few terahertz in frequency, but there's still kind of applications for this intraband sort of frequency conversion. And ideally it's gonna perform a lot better from a noise perspective. Uh, so then the first question is, okay, how well does it perform from a conversion efficiency uh, perspective? And you can see it's, it's actually a little bit worse. So we're kind of getting conversion efficiency of about 30% into this idler channel. And overall, the spectrum isn't quite as clean. When we had the down conversion, if you look at this converted idler channel, you know, it's 20, maybe 30 dB above all of these other sort of noise sidebands that are generated. Whereas in this case, we're on a linear scale and this upshifted idler and the downshifted idler have almost equal conversion efficiency. And you know, that's no accident. That's because both of those idlers are equally well frequency and phase matched. And so again, if we wanna really get the maximal conversion efficiency, we need to be able to suppress, you know, in this case, a competing process, which might be this other idler. Um, but the good thing is the noise. It's the fact that, okay, if we just isolate this one channel, you know, how much noise do we have in that channel? And because the pumps are really far away spectrally, what we find is we can have pretty low noise levels. So we can have kind of femtowatt level noise uh, levels or probably even less than that. And so that we can perform kind of true quantum frequency conversion experiments. Uh, and so this is something that a former postdoc on Shimon Singh did together with Cheng a few years ago, or I'm sorry, two years ago. Um, and this was in collaboration with Jin Liu uh, from Sun Yat-sen University and Christian Schneider and Sven Huffling from the University of Würzburg, where now we really worked with the true single photon source as our input. So we took a device Jin had made, this is a quantum dot in the micropillar cavity, stuck it in a cryostat, cooled it down, extracted its single photons, and then frequency shifted it with our silicon nitride nonlinear optics. And we can see things like this pre preservation of anti-bunch photon statistics. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, other things that we looked at subsequently, or we looked at uh, you know, the preservation of coherence time. Uh, you can do things like take photons that are initially at different wavelengths. And then if you spectrally shift one to match the wavelength of the other, you can interfere them on a beam splitter and you can see this kind of Hongo Mandel interference. Uh, so that's you know, kind of, I would say a little bit of a, a whirlwind tour, but just talking about some of the things that we've looked at in terms of the nonlinear optics um, you know, in the past couple of years. And, I think I'm again at a little bit of a stopping point, um, but maybe you know since I only have a few more slides in the talk, I'll just um, you know finish these few slides and then um, leave you know time for questions if there's any. Uh, and so what I want to do now and, and kind of the remainder, maybe the next you know kind of eight minutes or ten minutes or so, um, is just talk about some of the current things we've been working on. So this is kind of you know the last last year or so. Uh, and so one of the things we really want to try and do is is go towards you know full integrated nonlinear devices. So not just a nonlinear resonator on its own with everything else being tabletop components, but putting more and more things together. Um, and so some of this work has been done in the context of this um, DARPA DODOS program that was about optical frequency synthesis. And it was led by um, John Bowers at UC Santa Barbara. And what my postdoc Ashutosh Rao did together with Greg Moy is we worked with this company, Ligen Tech in Switzerland to develop this kind of bilayer platform where we have a thick silicon nitride layer that we use for Kirkcomb generation. So this is actually a microresonator soliton frequency comb. And then we have a thin silicon nitride layer above it that's used for the typical linear functionality where you don't wanna have as many modes, for example. Uh, and what we're able to do is really show that you can couple very efficiently between these two layers just using adiabatic tapers. And this can be done over a very broad frequency range. So you can do this over the full octave, for example. And then Ashutosh has gone and he's looked at developing these different kind of spectral processing elements that you need, in particular for combs, you know, things like tunable bandpass filters, dichroic edge filters, MMIs, and, and so on. Uh, a second thing we've been working on recently has been done by uh, my grad student, Edgar Perez, and he's been working on kind of improving the way that we do coupling to chips, and in particular, the sensitivity of coupling to chips. 
um, through this kind of two photon lithography technique that, that many people may be familiar with. And what really Edgar did was work on methods that allow us to directly print uh, micro optics on the facets of photonic chips in, in kind of a very convenient way. And these micro optics really improve our, our sensitivity to alignment tolerances, for example. You know, one of the things I've, I've talked about so far is that in these silicon nitride rings, the way that we engineer dispersion and phase matching is through geometric control, changing primarily the resonator cross section. And, and one kind of downside there is that it's not a mode selective control. So when we change the resonator you know, width and thickness, we're really influencing all of the modes of that ring. You know, in contrast, if you remember that thing we did where we wrote gratings on the inner sidewalls, that was actually altering the frequency of a very specific mode within the ring. And so what we looked at recently, what Xuan looked at recently was, was how well we can control that sort of frequency splitting process. Uh, and also can we split, you know, not just one mode of the ring, but maybe multiple modes of the ring. And, and kind of the idea is that instead of having, you know, a single periodicity for your modulation, what happens if you have some superposition of periodicities? Uh, and what Xuan was able to show is that, it, you know, this kind of works. So this is some data where we have uh, modes in the 1550 nanometer band of a ring resonator. And we've gone and we've targeted five specific modes and, and done things like just varied the amount of splitting we have for the different modes, varied which modes that we're really targeting, and really show that this is a controllable process and that modes that you don't target are relatively unperturbed, whereas the modes you target are, are controllably perturbed. And so, you know, we're quite excited about this because it, it takes a micro ring resonator, which is quite good at achieving some things like high Q. Uh, but now, you know, previously we had maybe this Mode, ins mode insensitive uh, control. And now we have much more of a mode selective control. And I should say that you can do these mode splitting devices while still retaining high cavity quality factors. So we've seen things in excess of, you know, I think this is a little out of date. I think we've seen them in excess of a million by this point. You know, I mentioned earlier that with the forward mixing Bragg scattering for, for down conversion, there are some issues with respect to noise with the current scheme that we use or the previous scheme that we use. And so Ashutosh has been working on improving this basically by increasing the separation between our input signal and its you know, corresponding pump and the output idler and its corresponding pump, just to suppress the possibility of the spontaneous forward mixing from these pumps starting to spectrally overlap these channels that we care about. And we've been looking at this not just for the quantum dots that we like, but also for systems like color centers and diamond. Yeah, another interesting thing that's come up has been from Shiwen is to look at a different process based upon the chi-3 nonlinearity for, for quantum frequency conversion. And so what we're looking at here is, is kind of third order sum and difference frequency generation. And, and so it's kind of an intuitive process, right? When we typically think about sum and difference frequency generation with chi-2 in a single stage, you know, you basically have one, pump, one photon that makes up the difference in energy between your input signal and your output idler. In this case of the third order sum difference frequency generation, we just have two photons that make up that difference. And you can find geometries for which this should work in terms of the phase and frequency matching and conversion efficiency should be able to approach, you know, kind of unity for getting power levels on the order of, of maybe kind of uh, tens of milliwatts. You know, but the motivation is really in terms of noise. It's the idea that when you do this third order sum and difference frequency generation, your pump can be the longest wavelength that's employed in the system. And so it's not gonna hopefully produce very much noise in these you know, target bands. And in particular, we have geometries where the spontaneous Fourier mixing is actually completely inhibited. And of course, you know, this isn't necessarily the case when you think about having these very widely separated frequency bands and you do like a single stage chi 2 process because then you might need to stick your pump right in the middle uh, in between your input signal and your output idler. Or for our Bragg scattering also, we tend to have to have you know, one of these pumps in between these two things when we wanna be able to do very broadband conversion. Um, so we think it's a pretty interesting process. I do want to say it's kind of reminiscent of what Marty's group has done with, with Chi2 already in terms of using kind of a cascaded scheme where you essentially take your input signal and you first down convert it to an intermediate wavelength using this long wavelength pump. And then you have a second stage where you, you, where you down convert it to the target wavelength using the same intermediate pump, but just kind of a different waveguide in terms of the, the nonlinear optics essentially. I did say, you know, I wanted to say one or two things about frequency combs. And so, you know, Greg Moy has been the real person pushing this. And the reason why I wanted to talk about frequency combs is, is both because they're interesting for things like clocks, but also a lot of the underlying technology in nonlinear physics is, is similar. Uh, and so some of the things that Greg's been working on, you know, we've been really happy to work with John Bowers group at UCSB. They developed this marvelous algas on insulator platform where 
The effect of nonlinearity is a few hundred times larger than that of silicon nitride. So it's really an ultra low power platform, but it also has very strong thermorefractive effects. And so what we worked on with John's group was to demonstrate you know, for the first time, the generation of micro resonator solitons in this kind of platform. And more generally, Greg has been looking at things like the interplay between you know, kind of Kerr dynamics and thermal effects in, in these kinds of systems and looking at these things at, at cryogenic temperatures where we can suppress some of the thermorefractive effects. And he's also worked on developing kind of open source software for modeling these microcombs, which I'm sure he'd be happy to touch base with people if, if they're interested in giving it a try. You know, then the final thing I want to spend, you know, kind of two minutes on is this very recent work that, that Xiuen did that was just published um, this month, which is related to getting actually pretty good Chi-2 effects in silicon nitride. And so, you know, off the bat, I said, well, we're going to use silicon nitride for Chi-3. Um, but it is possible to get, you know, kind of effective Chi-2 in, in this kind of medium through this kind of DC Kerr effect where you combine a DC electric field with the Chi-3. And this is something like Mike Watts's group at MIT has done to do SHG in, in silicon waveguides before. And what, what Shi Wen did was basically really try and take all the tools that we developed for the silicon nitride resonators for phase and frequency matching modes that are really separate, um, and then took advantage of this, this uh, DC Kerr effect basically. Uh, and so there's some peculiarities in silicon nitride about how you generate this DC field. It, it doesn't have to be through explicit electrodes. You can actually generate it optically through something called the photogalvanic effect. Um, but what's quite interesting in the end is that you can get pretty good efficiency. So Xuan showed kind of an overall conversion efficiency as high as about 22%, which means that you put 10 milliwatts of laser into the device and you get 2.2 milliwatts of SHG out. Um, in terms of a normalized conversion efficiency, this is much lower than what you have in, in media like, like lithium niobate, for example. And that's due for a number of, of reasons in terms of things like um, you know, how strong a DC field we can generate and how strong an effective Chi-2 you have in the system. It's also, I think, related to the photogalvanic effect intrinsically that you really can't operate these devices right now at lower powers. Um, but it is also quite compelling for certain kinds of applications because we can do these microresonator frequency combs in silicon nitride. And now we have this second harmonic generation uh, possibility at the same time. Okay, so I think you know, kind of at the end of my talk, I hope that it was reasonably comprehensible. And I just wanna you know, summarize kind of the key points again. Uh, and so one of them is that I think that nonlinear nanophotonics um, is a flexible way to generate and transduce states of light that are relevant to quantum. And it, you know, I think it's quite interesting because you can use the simple geometric control that's provided by you know, kind of modern fabrication technology to try and access these different wave wavelengths. There's a tremendous amount of work to do to try and actually make these devices practically usable, um, you know, so that people have, you know, kind of full integrated nonlinear photonic systems that are a better alternative than kind of building something up on the tabletop using, you know, very well-developed, um, more conventional technology. And then the final point I'll make is I think there's a lot of opportunities to utilize kind of the full range of nanophotonics design and simulations and, and materials and fabrication that that's being developed in the community. So all these ideas from inverse design or these new material platforms um, or you know, platonic crystal concepts and so on could be applied to the kinds of problems that, that I've mentioned today. So that's kind of the end of my talk. I, I definitely wanna make sure and acknowledge the people who do the work. I think I went through and, and named all these folks in my lab um, during the talk. I also wanna acknowledge Darren Wesley, Marcelo Devonso and Rob Illick who work at, at NIST and Gatorsburg as well. Darren is a uh, you know, fantastic process integration engineer who does a lot of the work related to frequency combs. Uh, we collaborate quite extensively with Scott Papp's group from NIST Boulder on, on Kerr combs and other nonlinear optics and kind of the overall vision for this kind of work. Uh, I mentioned the collaboration with John Bowers and Ligentech and some of the quantum frequency conversion work. And I also want to thank uh, NIST for its funding and also thank DARPA through you know, kind of a series of programs. They're funding a lot of this development in, in nonlinear nanophotonics. Um, so that's kind of uh, all I have to say, unless there's any questions, and, and, and thanks for paying attention. Thank you very much, Karthi, for a very uh, nice and um, uh, clear um, presentation. Um, so we are open for questions. Maybe I can start by a quick question. Um, so when you were talking about the photon pair sources, um, right. I was just wondering how um, how flexible you are um, to control the um, frequency of the signal in either photons, given all the uh, engineering and all the conditions you have. Right. I think you know at the moment, to our understanding, there's kind of a great amount of flexibility. I mean. 
we haven't pushed, you know, wavelengths below, I would say, um, you know, probably the shortest wavelengths we've gone right now is around 560 nanometers. So, you, you know, if you look at frequency space, there's still a lot of frequency space left, obviously, you know, in the visible, you know, blue would go down to maybe 750 terahertz or something, and then you have all the UV and everything. Um, but within this kind of region of kind of the green to the near infrared, we think that with the silicon nitride platform, you have enough flexibility to basically hit, you know, any one of these wavelengths. And you have to do some redesign, obviously, if you're going to change your pump wavelength. Um, but just this kind of simple geometric control that I've shown so far, I think, is is sort of you know sufficient. Um, you don't have I to miss do... it. Sorry, uh, sorry, how, uh, sorry. Uh, maybe I missed it. But how do you actually uh, do you have only one uh, per, um, signal, one uh, either lines uh, being generated, or you can have yeah, multiple? So or how do you control maybe, that? Maybe I can go back here. Um, I, I kind of maybe didn't do a great job of making this point. So, sorry for all the scrolling back. Uh, one more, here we go. Um, and so this is kind of like what our photon pair spectrum basically looks like. So there's the, the pump region around here. And so certainly depending upon the device, you can have some additional spectral tones that are due to spontaneous Fourier mixing near the pump. And, and so you would have to basically engineer to frequency mismatch those modes. Um, but then in the signal and idler bands, you really have one kind of dominant pair, basically. And, and you see these other, these other photons. And what these other photons are, these are basically modes that are also phase matched, uh, but they're frequency mismatched. And so basically, they have a, a frequency mismatch that's larger than the cavity line width. And that's why it's suppressing the photons that you generate. Um, and so I think it's, it is really possible to engineer this so you can have a very clean spectrum with one signal channel and one idler channel. You know, in contrast, you could also engineer a very flat dispersion so that you could generate lots of signal and either channels. And that's kind of the regime of this, you know, these so-called quantum frequency combs that like Morandotti's group and, and Andy Weiner's group has, have been looking at. Um, but, you know, in terms of like the engineering of the frequencies, you know, that that's shown a little bit here, basically, where, you know, by changing kind of the ring width and changing which modes we're pumping on, you know, we have basically these signal wavelengths that can change anywhere from, you know, 630 nanometers to 800 something nanometers. And, and in this case, you, know, you have to satisfy energy conservation. So because our pump is really constrained here, if we vary the signal wavelength so much, the idler wavelength is going to vary a lot as well. And so what you would probably rather do is give yourself more flexibility, you know, with the pump wavelength. Uh, and so if you do that, you know, that was kind of what was shown here where if we change the pump wavelength a little bit more dramatically, so we're not just going from 920 to you know kind of 960 nanometers, we change it to a completely different band and kind of re-engineer the device. So in this case, it's not just the ring width, we change the thickness as well. Um, then that allows us to do something where we have a 780 nanometer photon that we want specifically, and then our photon that's the idler is much closer to the telecom band instead of being somewhere out you know at 1800 nanometers or something like that. So I hope that was that that kind of made sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Can I ask a question, Karthik? Yeah, sure. Yeah, very nice talk and a lot oh, of thanks. interesting. I appreciate videos. that. Um, so I um, I was wondering, since you have a pretty strong chi two in uh, silicon nitride now, is it possible to think of doing some frequency generation for uh, quantum frequency conversion now using chi two instead of the four wave mixing brack scattering chi three that you showed? Yeah, I think absolutely that that's possible. You know, I, I would say that what, what will for sure, I believe, work, I, maybe I shouldn't say for sure because we haven't done it, but I think what will work is that you could always apply like this, this external DC field, you know, so put some electrodes, make a DC field, and then you'll have this DC Kerr effect, and then you can get like SFG and, and DFG and so on to work. Mm -hmm. You know, the specific process that we showed was this case where the DC field is generated optically through this kind of coherent photogalvanic effect. And that's sort of an interesting effect because it's, it's basically a kind of feedback process, basically. So you have a little bit of like weak intrinsic chi 2 in your system because it's not bulk. It's, you know, kind of a, it's a waveguide or a ring. So it's not, you know, purely symmetric. And that kind of intrinsic chi 2 that you have gives you some second harmonic signal. And that together with your pump drives this photogalvanic process that gives you a DC field. And once you have some DC field, then you generate more second harmonic. And it's kind of like this feedback sort of process. And, and so this is just a long-winded way of saying, like, I'm not 100% sure that the photogalvanic process 
will be the most convenient one to use for quantum frequency conversion. But I think this overall idea of a DC Kerr process, you know, with silicon nitride is, is quite reasonable for, for such things. Then do you also see the photogalvanic effect like uh, increase with times, like some of the, you know, uh, second harmonic generation that has been seen in some of the Swiss groups, for example? Yeah, it, absolutely. So, I mean, this work definitely, you know, builds upon the stuff that was done, you know, in, in Camille's group and EPFL and, and some of the other works and, and photogalvanics have been along for a super long time uh, in fibers. And so we, we see sort of similar phenomena. The time scales are pretty different because we have these micro resonators and like, you know, the, the persistence times and a lot of the kind of the microscopic physics are things that I would say we don't, we don't really understand at the moment. Um, so not that it's, it can't be understood and it can't be controlled. Um, but on the other hand, if you, if you want to kind of make it happen right away, you could probably apply, you know, DC field uh, externally and, and start to get some of these things to work. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. I've got a question. Hey, Leo. Hi. Uh, beautiful talk and fantastic work. Uh, thanks. Uh, it, I'm enthusiastic about these um, resonators and uh, frequency conversion in lots of the different ways that you've talked about. Um, if one is not part of one of these giant DARPA programs and one has an atom that they're interested in, whatever that happens to be, strontium or ytterbium or iodine, how much effort is it to go back and actually engineer, build devices in terms of people, time, cost? Yeah, I mean, these are excellent questions. You know, I, I, what I would say, I, I think that um, it's, not, it's not negligible, obviously. I mean, there's, there's effort. Um, I think what there has to be is kind of the close collaboration between kind of the end user and the, the person who's kind of designing and making the device. So like, if you told us right now, you know, we want to connect to these specific sort of, um, you know, transitions, we could probably come up with a device geometry relatively quickly and maybe even make that thing relatively quickly given the fabrication. But then what you might see when you get the device and you try and operate it is that, oh, this thing does not like operate in exactly the same way that I'm used to with with you know, Piplin or some other sort of technology that's kind of well developed. And so then there has to be kind of some back and forth in terms of you know, how these things operate. And, and then part of it is also just you know, the investment that we put into to making these things kind of more accessible, right? So if I give you just like a chip, you have to build you know, obviously the waveguide coupling setup and all these other sorts of things for getting light in and out of it. It may not be the most stable thing in the world. If we do you know, kind of better fiber packaging and so on, then, then it's gonna be, you know, be, be easier. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, it's not like a concrete answer, but I think that I would say, at least for our part, these are the kinds of things we're quite interested in is, is at some level, you know, kind of developing the technology on its own and, and just relying upon our kind of internal metrics is not um, nearly as useful as somebody really putting it to practice and sort of seeing that like, you shouldn't waste time trying to increase the conversion efficiency by 20%, you should, you should spend time on this thing um, or, or that thing. So, so I hope that that answer is sort of yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So got a question in the uh, chat box. Um, I'm just going to read it out. Um, so Hubert, Hubert is asking um, about the micro lenses that you uh, talked about, if they're directly placed on the chip facet and um, how much they're improving the light um, coupling efficiency. Yeah, sure. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find a smarter way to, to get to that slide. I'm gonna say that that is probably unlikely. So <laughs> just get to it again. But uh, what I would just, you know, just kind of going into it. Yeah, we, we print these these lenses directly on the facet. So this is uses this um, kind of two photon interference lithography um, uh, technique or not two photon interference, just two photon lithography technique um, using this tool called the Nanoscribe, which is a, a commercial tool. And, and basically you put polymer, you know, resist on this, uh, you know, on the facet of this photonic chip and then we, we write these lenses. And the reason why we kind of worked on this technique in the first place is because we really want to be able to print on the facets directly. So have the orientation of the chip be in this kind of direction and print on the facet. Because if the orientation of the chip is kind of in the usual kind of horizontal orientation, the chip itself kind of actually obscures your ability to print the lens. 
And so the groups that have been quite successful at doing this have, have developed a lot of technology and simulation tools to deal with the fact that you have this obscuration. It's, it's kind of, you know, like not proximity effect correction, but some kind of correction that you have to do for that. Um, and so what we worked on, what Edgar really spent quite a bit of time on is figuring out how you can print directly on facets. And so this is kind of where this machine vision kind of comes in and figuring out how you can locate, you know, the center of a tiny waveguide on the facet. Um, so then to get to your question about like how well these things work, you know, unfortunately, I would say right now in terms of coupling efficiency, they're not better than the best lens fibers that we can use. So like a best lens fiber to one of these waveguides with an inverse taper would maybe give us, um, you know, kind of 2 dB of coupling loss. This is kind of a, a nonlinear waveguide, so it's a pretty thick silicon nitride layer. And with this, this kind of micro lens, you know, maybe we're going to get 3.5 dB of, of coupling loss in the best case, though that's with a cleaved fiber. So it's no longer a lensed fiber. And so then when it's a cleaved fiber, it's kind of interesting for us because we can think about using fiber arrays. And, and then the specific data that's being shown here is just showing that the misalignment tolerance is, is a lot better because we're using a cleaved fiber basically. And because this, this lens is helping a lot essentially. Um, so at the moment, it's not better in terms of absolute coupling efficiency. It's better with respect to these other metrics. But I think it, you know, a lot of that comes down to sort of our lens design and trying to understand better what losses we might have in these lenses, which at the moment, I would say we don't really understand very well. I got another quick question uh, about uh, the um, frequency conversion work with the quantum dots that you mentioned. Um, right. uh, the work that you showed that uh, it was conserving the coherence uh, properties and uh, et cetera, how much conversion efficiency you had in that um, system? Yeah, so, so both of these uh, kinds of experiments were done, um, and I kind of went through this fast, but this was done kind of in like this what I was calling like the lower noise limit, basically. So this limit uh -huh. where the pumps are widely separated from the signal and idler. And so then the kind of the, the conversion efficiency, you know, was this kind of 30% number basically, because we, you know, we spectrally filter this one channel that we care about. If you, if you added up all of them, you're going to get higher conversion efficiency, but we really cared about, you know, one channel. And then what we did with the coherence and so on, I mean, what, what's kind of, you know, difficult with the quantum dots is that in general, they don't produce phase coherent photons. So, you know, you have all these processes associated with phonons and, and um, uh, spectral diffusion and those kinds of things, charge noise, that mean that you don't necessarily get phase coherent photons all the time. So what the second paper basically did is we generated the photons through spontaneous Fourier mixing. And so those photons are phase coherent. There's nothing that's going to decohere them during the, the generation process, basically. Uh, and then we use those same kind of frequency converters, but then we looked at things like the interference of the photons where kind of initially the photons are, are non are non degenerate, but frequency conversion can make them degenerate. And then if you interfere them, you should really see that you have this kind of, you know, Hong Mandel interference associated with their, their, you know, bosonic character, basically. I just, sorry, just a really quick question about sure. the, um, uh, when you're using geometry to engineer the dispersion and the color of light that comes mm -hmm. out, um, if there's any like opportunities or thoughts about active tunability if possible in these systems? Yeah, I mean, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so I think that, you know, one thing that we, we certainly don't have at the moment, I would say is a good way to actively control the dispersion. Um, We've looked at various things like, you know, in semiconductors, you have carrier effects and, and so on. But I think ultimately what you could do, I mean, what I think is certainly possible is if you were to take, you know, a coupled ring system, uh, you know, something like people do this for the lasers, basically, they use this Vernier effect, um, where you have two coupled rings, and you can tune kind of the resonance frequencies. That would be one way that you could get active control. Um, and you know, maybe there's other ways. I mean, there's all these kind of cool things people do with, with different kinds of materials and so on. Um, but I would say for us, we haven't, that's not something we've done. I, I think it would be important. I mean, if we wanted to make our OPOs really behave like how a TISAF behaves and you should have some of this kind of more active tuning, you know, at the moment we can basically just do some thermal tuning. Um, but, but it is something that, that's kind of challenging in these monolithic geometries. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Um, 
comments, remarks, anything? That's cool. Some kind of icons popped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you can clap here. Yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thanks right. everyone. I you know. Yeah, thank you very much, Carter, for doing this. Yeah, and yeah. I... It... Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for doing it. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. See you, Sarkan. Bye bye.